Thank you. So my name is Sander Mack, and uh, welcome here in this talk, Java 9 Modularity in Action. As you can see, there's a second name up here on the slide. It's uh, Paul Bakker. He's my co-worker co at uh, Luminous Technologies. And uh, we are actually together currently writing a book for O'Reilly on the new Java module system. So he couldn't make it here, so I'll try to entertain you all by myself. I think uh, we'll be OK. Um, but anyway, this talk will be at, uh, about the new module system that's coming in Java 9. So this is actually my first time here at JokerConf in Russia. And oh my, you guys really like your low-level bytecode, assembly, et cetera, et cetera. I saw some amazing talks already. And that's great. That's, that's great. But this talk is really at a different level of abstraction. So if you talk about modules and the module system, we're really talking about the large-scale structure of your application rather than the low-level bytecode stuff happening uh, at the instruction level. So hopefully, you guys think about that as well, because I believe it's important to create modular applications. And the Java module system will give us some tools to actually improve on what's currently possible in Java. So a bit about my background. Um, so I work for uh, Luminous Technologies, and uh, we have been involved in modular software de development for quite a while, uh, originally using OSGI quite a lot, um, with some ups and some downs. Um, we won't go into that here. But this is really something that we care about in our products that we build. And that's also what piqued our interest into Java 9 and everything that's going on in the Java module system there. So today, I want to give you an introduction to the module system. This won't be something that covers all the nitty-gritty details of the module system. This will take you from zero knowledge to actually knowing what to talk about when you uh, are using the module system in Java 9. So uh, the talk is structured like this. First, we're going to talk a bit about modularity itself. What does it actually mean to be modular and why would you want that in your applications? And then we'll move on to the Java module system itself. As you know, Java 9 isn't out yet, and it won't be out until summer next year, hopefully, if it doesn't get po postponed again. Uh, but we do have early access builds, and I can show you some demos and some working code with the Java module system. Once we know how the modules work and how we can create modules, we can talk about mechanisms that are built on top of these modules. And one of these mechanisms is the services mechanism, which is actually a very nice way to achieve even more decoupling between your components and your application and linking, which is a fairly new thing that you can do uh, starting from Java 9 with the module system to actually statically link your Java code. And we'll see that it's pretty nifty and um, nice. Of course, we don't all build our applications from scratch. We have existing code, I have existing code, you have existing code. So we'll touch upon the, the topic of migration uh, for a bit as well. Uh, again, this will be introductory. Um, uh, we have another talk on migration as well. That's a full talk in and of itself. But I'll give you the sort of the condensed version in this talk as well at the end. So why modularity? Well, for us, it's not just something technical. Even though you need to have the tools and techniques to create modular applications, what we really think is important is that having a modular application means you can be really agile. And that's a business advantage as well, not just a technical advantage. If you look at uh, software development practices, we all know how it goes, right? You start a new project with a couple of people, everything is going great, and a couple of months in, you have an awesome application, it works, everybody's happy. And then about a year after that, the team has grown, and more and more features have been added, or removed, or changed, or, well, you know how it goes. And suddenly, this code base isn't all that great anymore. You start changing something here, and suddenly something over there breaks, and you start changing something here, and you think, wow, this is, this is an isolated piece of code. This shouldn't really affect anything else, and it does. And that's something that we all have experienced. So that's also something that uh, modular development can help you prevent. It can help. It cannot solve all your problems. You still have to think, fortunately. But it can help you uh, by enforcing boundaries, by being explicit about which module interacts with, uh, with uh, other modules, and so on. So by applying both modular design practices and tools and techniques like the upcoming Java 9 module system, or in the current practice for us, OSGI, we create code bases, code bases that are as agile as our business demands. Now. What is this modularity all about then? 
one of the most important aspects of modularity is actually hiding stuff. And that sounds a bit strange, because why would you want to hide stuff? Well, look at this picture. You have components in your system. Hopefully, you have some sort of mental model about which components are sort of belonging together and which components have to interact, etc. But what you really do not want is that your colleague from the other team tries to grab into the internal implementation details of your component just because it's convenient for him to do so and he likes to do it. Because the moment your colleague do, does that, it means you will have to support the actual class, the actual API that he's using. Because if you change that, then he will be mad, and you will, ha and you will have problems, etc. So what you actually want to do is you want to draw sort of a box around a component, around your code, and say, only this part is public. This is the public interface of the module. And for the rest, how I implement this API, that's not a, none of your business. Right? It's sort of the same principle that we have with REST, where we don't really care what's behind it. We just know we talk HTTP to it, and we have sort of a specification of the uh, API. You want to do this in your, inside your application as well. And I may hear you thinking, OK, well, don't we already sort of have this in Java with the private, protected, package private uh, modifiers? And yes, up to a certain point, this is possible in Java. So you can make fields private, and you can have private classes and factories, although it gets a bit hairy there already. And you can have packages where you share code between classes, but not outside of the package. That all works. But we're talking about a bit higher level of abstraction here. Because the moment you create a component that contains multiple packages, and these classes inside these multiple packages need to interact, you're forced to make them public. And public in Java means really public. So you put it on the class path, and literally any other class can reach into this public class and use it, which is counter to what we want in this scenario. We want to hide stuff, and we want to be able to draw sort of a box around multiple packages as well as sort of a software component, a module. So important part here is we want to hide stuff, and we have some tools in Java, but they're not great. And we want to be explicit about the contract between uh, components, modules, parts of our system. We want to be explicit in what is actually shared and what is internal implementation details. So that's so far so good. And uh, you may think, what's happening on that front? Well, Java 9 is progressing quite nicely. There's a jigsaw prototype, which is the nickname of the module system, which already implements a, a large part of the module system. And that's available for download currently, even in early access uh, builds. There's a JSR, uh, which is not final yet, but it contains, uh, it contains all the uh, preliminary uh, specs for the module system. But you should also keep in mind that this all is work in progress. So the things that I'm going to show in this introductory talk about the module system are fairly stable, I would say. But the more you get into the details and the more nitty-gritty implementation uh, questions, which you will probably have after this talk in the discussion zone, the more uncertain it gets, because it's still work in progress. So keep that in mind. What's uh, already there uh, is neither complete nor perfect, but it gives a very good picture of what's coming. So if you look at uh, the project Jigsaw, it actually has two goals, two main goals. And the first one is a rather selfish goal for the JDK team. Because they said, look, we have this big runtime library of tens of thousands of Java classes in, uh, currently in rt.jar or tools.jar, all the jar files bundled with the JDK. And it's really getting unmanageable. They had exactly the problems that I talked about in the beginning of classes that shouldn't be entangled, got entangled and classes that shouldn't be used from people outside of the JDK were used by people out of the, outside of the JDK, even though the documentation stated, don't use these classes, people do. And I mean, why not? Because you can, and if you can, people will. Um, so they said, this is not really future-proof, right? If we want to evolve the JDK further, if we want to even maybe remove functionality at a f future date, if we want to make uh, it as uh, life for ourselves easier, then we have to modularize the JDK itself because we want to have the benefits of these clear components that have clear interfaces between each other and have explicit dependencies between each other. And also, we want to have 
encapsulation, because that's actually the formal term for hiding stuff, encapsulation. We want to have encapsulation of these internal implementation detail classes in the JDK so that people won't accidentally rely on them. So that was a very big, strong goal for the JDK team. But at the same time, when you're going to modularize the JDK and create a module system, you may ask yourself, why not open this mechanism up for application developers as well, so they can also use the module system to modularize their own applications. So that became the second goal. And I'm not saying that it's um, a lesser goal, but you really have to keep in mind the perspective of the JDK developers here. They start, it all started from modularizing the JDK itself. And if you have modules with explicit dependencies between them and with uh, encapsulation, et cetera, then you can actually start thinking about reliable application composition, as it's called. Currently, we just throw all the jars that we have on the class path and hope for the best. But who knows? Maybe you miss something. Maybe there's a duplicate, etc. If you have explicit module information, you can do much better. A third one, and the jury is still out on whether that's actually going to improve, but the third one is that they wanted to improve the security of the Java platform. So you can imagine that lots of those internal implementation classes of the JDK offer unsafe functionality, unsupported APIs, uh, sometimes with scary semantics. And if you can actually hide those, encapsulate those, maybe, hopefully, the zero-day zero day exploits and uh, other attacks uh, on, the, on the JVM and the Java runtime will decrease as well. So that's a thought that, uh, that happens as well. So currently, what has happened in JDK 9 is that, yes, indeed, the JDK itself has been modularized. Also, there's, like I said, a prototype already for the module system that we as developers can use. And in fact, it is exactly the same module system that we can use that has been used to chop up the JDK, which is great. But again, there's no finalized spec yet. So everything we see here is probably somewhat in the right direction but the details may still change. And if you look at the history of modularity in Java, oh my, it took its sweet time. You see, it goes all the way back to 2005 and maybe even farther back. Um, I'm not really that great at digging. So if you see um, what has happened in the meantime, there have been lots and lots of attempts uh, to create a module system for Java. And you might even say that doing it in Java 9 it's really a bit late, and it's a bit sad that it didn't happen earlier. But, well, that's the world we live in, and that's, uh, those are the constraints we have to work with. So we thought that Jigsaw was coming in Java 7. It didn't. We thought it was coming in Java 8. It didn't. We thought it was coming in Java 9 in February next year. It doesn't, because it has been postponed for four months. But still, I'm hopeful that actually summer next year, uh, Java 9 will be released with a module system. And the interesting thing here is that the Jigsaw prototype is sort of a branch of OpenJDK where they explore all the possibilities of the module system. But an earlier version of that branch with some of the basic features of the module system has already been merged back to the main line of OpenJDK. So there's sort of no turning back anymore. So that's why I'm saying I'm hopeful it, it will be there uh, next year. So, what about the modular JDK? What does it look like? And this is a very scary picture when you see it first, because there's lots and lots of names and lots and lots of uh, arrows. But at the same time, that's also the really great point about this picture. We actually know now which components in the JDK actually have dependencies to each other. And if you look closely there at the bottom, there's this base module, which is java.base which contains the Java Lang packages, the Java util, and all the things that you actually always need. And this is a fairly nice and self-contained Java base package. And if you look closely at this image, there are no cycles. Every arrow points down, and it's, it's really amazing that they pull this off on a JDK that's 20 years old, that has grown organically without any Of course, I did think about modularity, but they didn't have the tools, so there were all kinds of entanglements between the parts, but they really succeeded to create a fairly um, um, good module graph out of JDK, and that took a lot of time. Besides Java base, you also see, uh, for example, in the middle, the Compact 1 and Compact 2 and 3 um, modules here. Those represent the Compact profiles that you already had in Java 8, but they're now just implemented as modules. 
So what you see is that uh, modules can act as sort of a, a facade, a, an aggregator for other modules, like Compact One, which actually says with the fat arrows, okay, actually what I represent is the logging and the scripting module, and base, of course, but base is always an implicit dependency of every module, even um, uh, the, the ones you write yourself. So while this picture may be intimidating, it's also very good news that we can actually generate and create this picture. Another thing that's hopefully uh, very exciting to you as well is that we um, get the possibility to say goodbye to the class path. Because like I said earlier, the class path is all about just throwing stuff on there, on there and uh, it might look like you put on jar files there, but at runtime it's just a big list of classes. And every time a class needs to be loaded by the JVM, it will scan this whole big list and it will load the first one it finds. If it doesn't find one, it will give you a runtime exception. Uh, if it does find one, it picks the first one in the list that matches. So if you have multiple ver versions, you may run into problems later. There's all kinds of problems with the class path, which you're probably uh, all familiar with, uh, maybe even under the term class path hell. So modules um, show a way forward without this pain. And I have to say, the module system will be completely optional. So if you don't like what you see, if you don't like what you hear, you don't have to use it when Java 9 uh, is out. The class path will still be there, and it will still be with us for a very long time, I think. But I hope the demos and all the things I will show you will convince you that you really do want to use modules. So what do we get with modules in the new Java module system? So instead of these unstructured jars that end up on the class path, we get the possibility to, in the language, define modules. For example, my module, and we can say in this definition of the module explicitly that we require some other module. And what happens is that if this information is available both at compile time and at runtime, that the platform can help us to verify whether what we actually try to run can run. Because we know what other modules we need, and we know um, how they relate, relate to each other. So if it's not OK, we can actually get a warning before our application starts instead of at runtime. So these explicit dependencies between modules are a big part of what you, uh, uh, I think, will like about modules. Another thing has to do with the encapsulation that I talked about. So you can say that you require another module, but what, what does it actually mean? It means that you can see and use and access the public types, the exported types of the module that you're requiring. So in this case, you can see that java.base has, has an exported part exporting the Java lang packages, the Java time packages, the uh, Java util packages. Um, but there's also in red a part that's encapsulated that is not exported. And those contain the implementation classes coming from the comsun and the sun JDK internal namespaces. And these are all things that even though you require Java base, you cannot access. So this is the part where you actually get to hide stuff from other people and from other uh, users of your module. And this is not just something that's implemented as a class loader check or anything. This goes deep down into the VM. So even at runtime, if you try to get reflective access or if you try to work your way around uh, these boundaries, you will get an exception. And it may sound scary and very draconic, and there's lots and lots of discussion about how strong these boundaries should be. Um, I'm not going to into that here, but at least we get a mechanism to truly hide application details. So one of the questions that we get a lot uh, after this talk, and that's why I want to address this now, is, OK, this all sounds very interesting, and uh, modules sounds great, but didn't we already have OGI, right? And um, yes, of course, that's true. But if you look at what they did in the JDK, and if you look at how deep the separation between modules and the encapsulation goes in the JDK, it goes much, 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 much further than what OCI does using its class loader magic. And in fact, you couldn't even achieve this level of separation and modularity in the JDK itself, because OCI itself has been built on top of a lot of the core technologies that are in the JDK. So you get a sort of a chicken and an egg problem here. Still, you could say, OK, well, let the JDK team do what it needs to do to modularize the JDK. But 
then stop at that. Just let our, other people who are interested in doing modularity use uh, OSGI. And they could have done that, but they haven't. And you can argue this both ways, and uh, I'm not going to do that here. But one thing that I want to point out as fact is that OSGI itself has never seen a, a very big adoption rate in the Java world. Sure, there's a very uh, niche part of uh, the Java world that actually uses it very successfully, and that's great. But it's always something extra, right? If you have a library and you want to use it in OGI, you first have to find out whether there's the metadata for the OGI already there. And if it's not there, you have to create a pull request and have to hassle maintainers, etc. It's always something extra. And the tooling around it isn't great either. So yes, that would have been an option. But I think this is the better way forward. If we get modules in the Java language itself, in the platform itself, it will for force tool vendors to actually uh, implement the tooling for it. And it will make people think about it more than if it's just another library uh, for modularization. So I've been talking a lot, and I think it's time to look at some code, right? So let's do that. And frankly, I'm, I'm sort of sick uh, uh, of Hello World applications, just to demo. So we're going to look at something that's a bit more involved, though not, not really big. And um, that's a demo with an application that we call Easy Text. So what it does is it can read in a text file, and it can uh, call into another module, analysis module, which contains a text analysis algorithm. And it will give back the complexity. And this command line interface, CLI module, will print it to the out output. And there you have it, a really nice little example of a text analyzer uh, program. So we start with two modules. And I will uh, switch to the code now. So the first thing that you might notice is that uh, this is not an IDE. This is just a text editor, Atom, in this case. And that's not so much because I hate IDEs. OK, I secretly may uh, weep myself to sleep after using Eclipse, but that's not the point. Um, but the point is that IDEs currently don't really support all the cutting edge jigsaw model module features yet. So that's why I didn't want to use an IDE here. Also, I'm going to use the Java compiler and the Java command directly from the command line. And uh, that's just a better way to learn what's actually going on under the hood to, to really see what's happening. So that's why I'm just using a bare bones text editor here. So we have a source directory. And here we see two directories that correspond to the module names that I just had on the slide. And these are, in fact, two modules. So in the source directory, we don't directly have our nested packages uh, structure here. But we start with an, another top level directory denoting that we have a module with this name. But there's more. It's not just a directory name. There's also a module descriptor in the module info.java. And that also holds for the uh, EasyText CLI module here. So if we look at the contents, you can see it's uh, quite empty. Uh, we only have a module keyword and the name of the module. In this, in this uh, case, EasyText CLI. So it has to match the directory that we have here. But we can add lots of more information here later. And we'll see that we need to do that as well. So this module keyword, you may wonder, OK, what does it do for my existing code if I already have variables called module, et cetera? Um, no worries. It won't break your existing code. Module and all the other keywords that I will introduce later are only keywords in the context of this module info.java. So there's no clashes with existing code. So Quick look here at the analysis module. It has a similar structure, just module keyword and the name of the module. And let's try and see if we comp can compile this. So as you can see, I'm running a nightly uh, early access release of Jigsaw. And we're just going to use that to compile these two modules. And to compile the modules, we are going to use a new flag on the Java compiler called module source path. We're pointing it to the source directory. We also define the directory where the modules have to be compiled into. And this is something that many people forget, because we all use Maven and Gradle and all those build tools. But if you use the Java compiler directly, you need to provide all the individual source files that you want to compile in one go, which in this case would be uh, this file, this file, and these two Java files. Um, so I'm going to use a little trick here just to pass the current Java files in the directory. 
and we're going to compile those. So let's see, before we compile, what the code actually does. So we have a main class, main method, we're reading an argument, which is the file name that we're going to read. We're going to read the file, we're going to chop it into sentences, it's not really important here, but the interesting part is that we are going to instantiate a class from this module, from the analysis module. It's a flash Kincaid class because it's a flash Kincaid text analysis algorithm, and we call the analyze method with sentences on it. So that's fairly uh, straightforward. And if we're going to compile this with all the files to the compiler, you would expect this to work. But it doesn't. And it has everything to do with the strict boundaries between modules and the explicit dependencies that you need between modules. Because in this case, it says, okay, this flash king cake class that you're talking about, so this one, um, it's not visible because package Java moderated easy text analysis, this package, is not visible. And you may be wondering why is that, because I provided it to the compiler and it's there. And that's because in the module system, you can't just use everything you think about and want to use, you need to be explicit. So in this case, we're going to add requires easy text dot analysis, indicating that our CLI module wants to make use of code that is in the analysis module. And that should help us to compile this code. So there we go again. And unfortunately, we still run into the same issue. It still says the package Java model is the easy text analysis is not visible. And if you think back to the picture that uh, we had in the slides before, you saw that we had the explicit dependencies. Well, that's expressed here. But we also talked about encapsulation. So if we look at the module definition of the analysis module, you see it's empty. And the default for a module is to encapsulate all packages that are not explicitly exported, which is a good default, because you want to be explicit about what you share with the rest of the world. So in this case, that means that we need to be explicit about what we export, and we're going to export the package Java modularity. Oh. There we go, easy text analysis. And note that while requires takes a module name, exports takes a package name. So you're requiring modules, but you're exporting packages from a module. And in this case, this should be enough to set up the explicit relations and encapsulation for the project that we're, want, we're going to build. And indeed, we have a successful compilation. So what we saw here is that the compiler already helps us to enforce boundaries between modules, which is a really great feature if you have, if you have a large application with many, many modules and you want to be explicit about what module uses another module which is really uh, an architectural signif significant uh, choice. And it's not something that you should do lightly, taking in a de dependency on just another module. You need to think about that. And that's what you're forced to do here. So if we look at the out directory, we have the compiled uh, form of the two modules. And you can also see that the module info itself is compiled and retained for use at runtime. And that's actually really nice. And I will show you why that's nice. So we're going to run this application, and we're going to run it using the module path rather than the class path. And this module path will point it to the two uh, compiled modules here, and we're going to start the module. So instead of doing dash jar, we're doing dash m to start a module, easy text dot CLI. In this case, we also have to uh, provide the main class that we want to start because it's not a jar with a main entry point yet. You can also package modules into jars, and when they contain a module info, then those are modular jars, and you can actually uh, start them. Um, but in this case, we need to be explicit, so we're going to start CLI main, which is nice. We get a welcome prompt, please provide a file name. So let's try this on chapter three of our book and see if it works. And indeed, we get a flash in case score of 60. So I'll leave it as an exercise to the listeners to actually find out whether this is very complex or very easy. Um, you can find it on Wikipedia. But we have working software, and we have two modules that interact. Another thing that you might be thinking here is, well, OK, you use module path in instead of class path, but what's in the name, right? It looks the same to me. And what actually happens here 
is that we provide a module path, this out directory, containing several modules. It could be more modules than these. And we say we want to use the EasyText CLI module as a root module to be resolved in a module graph. And what happens is that when starting this module and this class, the module system looks at the metadata of EasyText CLI. In this case, it sees, oh, I require EasyText analysis. So it will try to find this module on the module path, and it will uh, link those modules together if they're found. But it will also warn us if there's a missing module. And to show that, I'm going to delete the easy text analysis module here. That's nice. And I'm going to run our application again. And we get a nice resolution exception here when starting the VM, which says, OK, you're trying to start your application, but the easy text analysis is not found, and it's required from the easy text CLI module. So this is an example of the reliable application composition that I talked about. And what happens here is that you are explicit uh, about the dependencies between modules, and this information is used to help you prevent uh, runtime errors. Because in a class path situation, if I would have thrown away this jar, then you would only, when the code gets executed, get a runtime exception, a class not found exception, etc. And you would uh, hit this when the relevant class was loaded, which might be somewhere in the future when some unsuspecting user clicks a button in your application and triggers a code path that is not normally triggered. And then class loading starts and it fails. So this is really something that prevents runtime errors if used correctly. Now, we have two modules. We have explicit dependencies, etc. But what I really don't like yet is that we're still very tightly coupled to this Flash King K class and this other module. We have to export it, and it's sort of an implementation detail, right? I don't need to know that it's really a Flash King K algorithm. Just give me some analyzer interface that I can call, and I don't care what the implementation is, uh, just make it work for me. And using the tools and the um, constructs that we've seen so far, that's not really possible. We need something more. And that's where we get into services. Because the problem that we have here is that we actually want to do some sort of inversion of control, right? We want to only talk to an interface without having to exactly know which implementation is behind this interface for a given service. And we do this all the time. We do this in Spring. We do this everywhere. We use dependency injection, etc. And the big question there is, how do I get access to these implementation classes if they're hidden inside of a module, if they're encapsulated? Because I cannot do the instantiation that's uh, shown here. And of course, like all problems in computer science, you can solve this by adding another layer of indirection. So that's also the solution that's taken here. And this uh, new layer of indirection is called the service registry. And actually, uh, it's a mechanism that has always been in Java for a long time already, uh, using services and service loader. Only it gets a new life with the module system. So what happens is that you um, have a consumer module, and this consumer module says, I'm interested in the instances of this given interface type. And please give me back instances without me having to know about these classes that implement the interface. And on the other side, we have a provider module which says, hey, I have an implementation of this interface. And I can provide you with uh, uh, this implementation class. Dear service registry, please provide it to any people who ask for it. And this way, the provider module and the consumer module are completely decoupled. There's no static requires relation between consumers and providers. And the only thing that's shared between the consumer and the provider is the interface. So how does, it, how does this work in the, in the module system when using services? So let's say we have a module My API, which exports a package called API, presumably containing an interface. And this is sort of the shared contract between the provider and the consumer. Now we have another module, which is the consumer module. And this one requires my API, because it needs to know about this uh, my service interface. But it also has a second statement where it says, this module uses com API my service, where my service is the interface. So this expresses the intent to the service mechanism that, OK, this module is interested in instances of my service. Then we also have the provider, where it says, also requires my API because the provider needs to implement the interface, so it needs access to the interface as well. 
and it has a provide statement. So instead, uh, it says, I provide something of type com API my service with the implementation class my provider my service impl. And the interesting thing here is that my provider, the package in this my provider module called my provider, is not exported. It's encapsulated. So no other module can actually access this my service impl, not even by accident. Only the service registry is now able to instantiate my service impl and provide it to any consumers that need it. So the last question that we need to answer here is, how do we actually get those instances in my consumer module? And that's using the existing service loader API. So there's a service loader load call, which you give the interface type in this case, and it will give you back an iterable of all instances that have been uh, located in the service registry. So that can be one provider module providing an instance, but there can also be multiple provider modules or even zero. This is the form of loose coupling that you can have using services. So I think it's time for a little demo of services. And for that, we're going to look at EasyText again. But now you'll see that it has grown a bit. So instead of the two modules that we had, we're going to extend this. And the whole goal is uh, to show that a modular application can be extensible. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another analysis algorithm, in this, in this case, the coleman liao um, algorithm. And these two should be implemented as services so that we can have loose coupling from our CLI module to the service implementations. And just because it's fun, we will also add a GUI. And this is a separate module living next to the CLI module, which reuses the analysis implementations. So we have two front ends that have two analysis back ends to choose from. Before we dive into the code, this is the structure of the solution. So we have the EasyText Algorithm API module, which contains the analyzer interface that everybody is interested in. So you can see here, and, and the arrows all are requires relations. You can see that the arrows go from the CLI and the GUI front-end modules to this API module, because they need to know about the analyzer interface to call a method on it. And the arrows go from the two implementation modules to the uh, API module, because they need to implement the interface. But the, the great thing here is there's no explicit coupling, no requires relation from the front ends to the implementation modules here. So if we were to add a third analysis algorithm, there would be no updating of the front ends. It would all be loosely coupled through the service, uh, service loader. And that's really uh, a great scenario if you want to have extensible applications. So one last thing here is that since we're going to add a GUI, we're going to use more than the, just the types that are in Java base. So we need to have explicit dependencies from the GUI module to some JDK platform modules that have our relevant JavaFX types as well. In this case, those are the JavaFX controls and the JavaFX graphics modules. So let's have a look at the code. So here we have the modules that I talked about. So with the API, Coleman, Kincaid, you can forget, forget about those two, but those are just uh, syllable counter implementations, which we need for some implementation of the uh, text analysis here. And on the CLI module, which we've already seen, and a new GUI module. So let's look at this one. And I'm going to reset this. Yep, there we go. So what we see here is that we have a main class extending JavaFX application. We use all kinds of types from JavaFX, so uh, we're outside of the realm of just Java base here, like I said. But the only import from our own other modules is coming from the API module, as you can see, for the analyzer interface and uh, some pre-processing class that has some helper methods. And what we have is that when we start the application, we're going to call service loader.load with the analyzer, the analyzer class, the interface that we're uh, interested in. And if we look at the analyzer interface, it's very simple. There's nothing module specific about this. It's just a Java interface containing a get name method, giving back the name of the uh, algorithm, and the anal analyze method to do the actual work. So if you go back to main, we see that we initialize uh, our analyzers uh, using the service loader.load. 
which also means that we need a user's constraint on the analyzer interface in our module descriptor. So that's here. And going back up, we see that we also require the API module because it contains the interface. We require the two JavaFX uh, uh, modules that we need for uh, our GUI. And there is also a very interesting export here because we're going to export our GUI package. You might think, why do that? Because nobody is going to use our main class from the outside. Um, and that's true. But we're going to export it not just to everybody, but to a single, uh, uh, to a single other module, and in this case, uh, to JavaFX graphics. So this is a qualified export where only JavaFX graphics get access to this um, uh, GUI package. And it needs to have access because JavaFX uses reflection to instantiate your application class and to actually run it. So there you see that also for reflection, we as module authors need to get and give permission uh, for this JavaFX uh, module to actually be able to do that. So that being said, let's just run the application and see what it looks like. There we go. And we have some sample text. And we can choose between two algorithms, which are service providers. So let's quickly uh, do one. We have a flash and case score of 80 for this sample text and a common Liao score of 7.5. That's OK. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we have a loose coupling between both the GUI and CLI frontends and the two implementation modules here. If you look at the module info, for example, of the Kincaid provider module, uh, you can see that it requires the API module again, and it provides something of type analyzer with an implementation class, Kincaid analyzer, which is not exported. And as you can see, a service provider itself can also use other modules to implement its own functionality. So in this case, the Kincaid algorithm also uses something of type syllable counter to actually implement this logic. So this all works uh, in, a, in a transitive way. And just to show you how loose the coupling is between these modules, I'm going to remove, in this case, the Coleman um, module. And I need to do this in the jar directory. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to remove the Coleman jar. So there we go. We delete it. And I'm going to run our application again without recompiling anything. I'm just going to use the Java command to run it with a reduced set of jars. And there we have it. Now we only have the Flash Kincaid class. Without any recompilation, it's all dynamically linked through services. So if we would add another module, or three, or 10, or whatever, with alternative implementations, they would show up here as well. So this sort of gives you a taste of what you can do with uh, services. So let's go back here, because we have uh, still uh, some exciting features left. And um, one of those is linking. And linking is something that's optional when you use the module system, but it's a very cool feature. At least I think it's a cool feature. And linking means that you can use all this explicit information that's in your module descriptors, because we're explicit both about what other application modules we use, but also about which modules of the Java platform we use. And all this explicit information can be used to create a so-called custom runtime image. And a custom runtime image is like a, a J, JRE, but only containing those modules that are necessary for your application. So it will contain just a subset of the platform modules from the JDK that your application need, needs uh, together with your application modules. And it will bundle a, a JVM. So this will end up being a completely standalone runtime image. Um, of course, this is then a OS and architecture specific image. So if you want to run it, run it on different OSs and different architectures, you would have to create multiple images. But still, this is a very nice uh, possibility because you can create very small runtime images. Also, this allows for an optimization phase which actually sees all the code of your application together with all the code of the JDK that's used. You have the complete picture. If you're completely modular, you have the complete picture of all code that's used and that's calling each other. And as you can imagine, that can uh, lead to very nice optimizations that cross class boundaries, that cross module boundaries, and so on. So I'm not going to go too deep into it. And there are some examples already implemented in JLink, because the tool to do this is called JLink. Um, 
But the nice thing is that JLink is plugin based, so even after the release of Java 9, uh, we as a community and Oracle as a JDK, JDK team will be able to implement optimizations as plugins to JLink. So let's look at an example of linking. And for that, we're going to use the same, um, uh, the same application again that we just looked at. So the easy text with the front ends and uh, service provider modules. And I'm going to give you an example of how you would use JLink. So let's do it like this. We're going to invoke JLink and give it a module path, and we're going to point it at the jars representing our application modules here. But we're also going to point it at the modules of the platform that we want to create an image for. So in this case, I'm creating a Mac-based image, so I'm just pointing to my Java home and the modules that are in the JDK for the Mac. But I could also point this at a uh, Linux or Windows JDK if I downloaded that and create an image for Linux or for Windows. Next thing we need to do with JLink is indicate which module we need to, uh, to, be, to have included in the runtime image. In this case, we say, okay, we're interested in building an image for the EasyText CLI module. And what happens is that JLink will take this EasyText CLI module and it will look at the require statements and it will take in all the other modules that it needs. And this way, it figures out the whole uh, module graph for our application. But there's one caveat here. Because we use service providers and uh, service consumers, we have a more loose coupling going on between the modules as well. Now, JLink could, of course, use the provides and the user statements to also find all the, module, all the providers and uh, add them to the image as well. It could do that, but it doesn't. And whether that's right or wrong, I mean, you can have a big debate about that, but the fact is it currently doesn't. So if we want to have any implementation of the um, uh, analysis algorithms as well, we need to add those explicitly to the image as well. So what happens is here we add Coleman and Kincaid and the uh, syllable counter implementation. And again, JLink takes care of resolving all the transitive requires dependencies of these modules as well. So we don't have to think about that, but we do have to think about which, module, uh, pro which provider modules we want to have in our images. So here are some uh, optimizations that I can do in the image. So I'm going to uh, strip debug symbols from classes. I'm going to compress it, and I'm going to output it into an image directory. And of course, I need to recompile and run the application just to get my jar back, which I just deleted. So there we go. No. Oh. No. There we go. And I need to run JLink again now. Okay. Now we get this image directory, which sort of looks like a JRE. As you can see, it has a bin directory, conf, lib. And in the bin, we can see that we get the Java runtime command, the key tool. That's also something that comes from Java base, which is also always present and a nice uh, wrapper script that starts our application. So if we do image bin uh, easy text CLI, it just starts our application without having to fiddle with the module path or setting up anything. It just works from this image. But the really nice thing is that this image itself is fairly small for a Java distribution. It's 21 megabytes, which is still Okay, it's still big, but if you compare this to, for example, my JDK, it's really much smaller, which is over 400 megabytes. And what's also interesting is that we can inspect which uh, modules ended up in this image by running the Java command, saying, okay, list modules. And you can see that it only contains java.base from the JDK platform. And for the rest, all these are my own application modules. Now, if I run list modules on the full Java JDK, you can see there's much, much, much more there. So we actually brought all this down to a single module in our image, Java base, and uh, created a very small image using that. Now, if we do the same thing, this is, uh, oh, there we go. 
If we do the same thing for the GUI module instead of the CLI module, it will, of course, look different in the output image because the GUI used those two JavaFX modules, and maybe they have transitive dependencies as well. So that's something that uh, JLink will figure out for us. It will create the image again. And if we look at this image, indeed, it is bigger. It's 49 megabytes now. And if we look at uh, what modules are in there, with the list modules again, you can see that there are now nine or even more um, modules from the Java platform itself in this image. So both the JavaFX control and graphics that we explicitly required from our GUI, but also their transitive dependencies from the Java platform. For example, Java Desktop, which is a fairly big module, and uh, even JDK JS object. Well, didn't know there was a dependency there, but luckily uh, JLink could figure that out for us. So the more you use from the platform, the bigger your image will get, of course. But at least it doesn't contain Corba and all the stuff that, uh, well, most of us luckily don't use anymore. So you can trim down your application to the bare minimum. So what do you need to do to prepare yourself for JDK 9? Because um, things, some things will get encapsulated that have been publicly available so far. Um, and fortunately, there are all kinds of command line flags to work around this. But the best thing that you can do is use the tool called uh, JDAPS. And JDAPS is already shipped with Java 8. Um, and you can use that to run on your classes and on your jars. And it will analyze it. And it will show you whether you use any internal implementation details of the JDK. And if so, if you, your application code, or your libraries uh, do that, you will need to prepare for Java 9, uh, either by haggling, uh, hassling your uh, library maintainers, saying, hey, Java 9 is coming, stop using those uh, internal APIs, or uh, by finding out which command line flags you need to use to actually uh, break through the encapsulation that has been added in Java 9, which is, of course, not preferable, but sometimes you uh, have no choice. So there's also a migration path, and that mainly revolves around automatic modules, because what happens here if you have uh, your application, for example, we call it demonstrator.jar here on the class path and using a library, commas lang 3 on the class path, um, that will work just fine, also in Java 9. But if we want to modularize our own application, and in this case, we can see that we use uh, the left pad uh, method of string utils, that's a very good reason to drag in a third party dependency, as we've learned from the JavaScript guys. So if we want to use a left pad from commas lang in this class, we can do this on the class path like this, right? We have Java compiler with the class path, and we have uh, the Java command with the class path. That all still works on Java 9. However, if we want to create a module, if we want to make our, dem our code into a module, this module is a named module, and it cannot reference any other uh, classes on the class path anymore. And there's a good reason for this, because if this were possible, then all the module descriptors in the world wouldn't help us because we still wouldn't know what exactly uh, a module uses if you can just access anything that's on the class path. So this doesn't work. So what should you do? Well, of course, the ideal would be to have commas lang as a module on the module path. However, for that to happen, a module descriptor needs to be created for commas lang, and that's not our code. So we could, of course, create it and patch the jar and, and create a real module out of it, but that's not really something that we want to do, right? And this is just one dependency, but our applications typically have tens of dependencies. So that's not really uh, the way forward. So that's where automatic modules come in. And what you can do is you can take a plain Java 8 or previous jar without any module descriptor and pick it up from the class path and put it on the module path. And by doing so, it will become an automatic, automatic module. And what happens is that this will become a module where the name of the module is derived from the jar file name. Essentially, just all the version information is stripped off. And um, it will be a module, but it won't be a very good module because it will export all packages and it will read, require, all other modules in the resolved module graph. So that's not great, but at least it's workable. And it helps us to modularize our own, our own applications without having to wait on all the library maintainers to update their uh, libraries to, uh, to Java 9 modules. 
So that's good, because if we use this, then we can actually say in our demonstrator module descriptor, requires comments lang, or oh, the three should be off here. Um, we can say that, and we can put it on the module path while compiling. So we have module path lib here, which contains the comments lang uh, um, file. And we can run it by adding our own modules on the module path, and also the lib directory containing this comments lang jar. And then it will magically work again. So is it all good? Well, like I said, it's still a work in progress. So there's a list of open issues. If you want to look at it, uh, here's the uh, URL. And there's still some pretty uh, interesting design discussions open. Uh, some of them have already been resolved, for example, around optional dependencies. There's a possibility uh, introduced already in the, in the prototype for optional dependencies. Um, also, we've talked about uh, encapsulation of code, but we also have resources in our jars, etc. So there's also um, uh, a proposal to handle that, to uh, allow encapsulation, but not too much, because otherwise everything will break of resources as well. But the two big issues that are uh, still currently uh, open are around uh, reflection, because like I said, even reflection cannot break through encapsulation. And that's a big thing, of course, because we have lots and lots of libraries that uh, rely on the fact that they can just grab any class they see and they can break into private fields, private methods, etc. So if this is not going to work anymore in a modular world, well, that's pretty bad, of course. So there are lots of proposals around this, and um, well, it's a tension between making sure that everything that currently works still works and doing the right thing. Because having a library poke into every detail of your application, well, that may be not such a good idea anyway. And I haven't talked about versions, and there will be definitely people here in the audience and saying, well, wow, you have modules, but you don't do anything with versions. What about that? Um, that's a deliberate choice by the Jigsaw team to omit those and to say, we're not going to solve the version selection uh, um, uh, problem for you or um, help you create module graphs with multiple versions of the same module. Um, there are ways to do some of those, these things, and later in the discussion zone we can, uh, we can talk about that. But this is really uh, a hot topic, because uh, it makes intuitive sense to say, okay, modules should have versions, and the module system should do something with that. But the current stance is that uh, the module system can verify whether a module graph is okay without any versions, and you should use your build tooling, like Maven or Gradle, to do the actual version selection. Okay. So to wrap this up, I think uh, the great thing about getting a module system into Java 9 is that it will uh, both force uh, the tool vendors to actually start caring about uh, providing the right tooling and right modularity, um, but also it will help us as developers think about the large scale structure of our applications and how to improve on that. It will give us uh, modularity not just at compile time, but also at runtime, and even before runtime, verifying that the whole module graph is okay and um, giving us errors if there's something missing, etc. So that's really uh, something that I think will be an improvement. So all in all, you could summarize this as that having the spotlight on modularity will be good for the ecosystem in general. And yes, there will be growing pains, and no, adoption won't be um, high a couple of months after the release of Java 9 because it's a serious change, and even though it's optional, um, you will still run into the fact that the JDK has been modularized and there are all sorts of uh, issues around that. But in the end, it will force us as developers to actually care about modular applications. So I want to point you at the fact that we are currently writing this book about Java 9 modularity, which contains lots more details about uh, what I just talked about. Um, you can already go to O'Reilly.com and get the early access release, the first Three chapters are in there now, and we're still writing and will be released on a rolling basis. Um, you can go to the URL for more details, the bit.ly URL there. We also have a Twitter account, which we use to tweet out uh, general news about Java 9 in the module system, and also about the progress of the book. So it's highly recommended. And with this, uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time. And uh, if there are any questions, I think we have... Uh, thank you very much, yeah. Sandra. Uh, we have time for just one short question. This question there. Uh, hi. For example, 
I have an application and I modularize it. And I, my application depends on two libraries. They mm -hmm. are modularized. Modularize it. So I put them uh, on the module path and they become automatic module. Uh, and library A also depends on the library B. Mm -hmm. And I depend on both of them. And then library B in the next ver version becomes modular mm -hmm. and uh, encapsulates the package that library A depends on. And library A is automatic module. They uh, hasn't yet become modular. Will it break? I'm not entirely sure if I follow your scenario, but it sounds like um, it will work because becoming a, a real module instead of an automatic module is actually should be a drop-in replacement if the requires and the exports of the um, uh, automatic module are still uh, right. If you use classes from uh, implementation packages that will be exported because it's an automatic module, then yes, of course, it will break after they become encapsulated, yeah. yes. Automatic module can access private packages from non-automatic modules, or uh, not? How do you mean? Uh, automat automatic module, the library that, that has not yet been uh, yes. modularized, can it access private packages from modularized libraries? No, no, it cannot. So, oh, so that okay. will break. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. OK, thank yeah. you. Thanks again. Uh, the You're other welcome. questions will be in the discussion zone. Okay. Thanks again. Bye.